concepts. Real property. Um, one of the, the, the first things that you're going to realize is that some of the terminology you have used, individually you have used, um, isn't quite how the professionals talk about it, isn't quite how an attorney would describe things. Um, and broadly, sometimes we refer, we refer to this as the language of real estate, okay? So real property is actually a legal term. Real property, first and foremost, is land. You know, it's interesting. It's all about the land. In the preamble to the US Constitution, the founding fathers talked about under all is the land. And the fact is that regardless of what anybody says, no one has actually bought or sold a home. Would you think about that for a second? Nobody has actually bought or sold a home. What we buy and sell is land. And if there's a home sitting on the land, the home goes with it. But if you look at a sales contract, if you look at your deed, those of you that own your home, pull out the sales contract when you bought it, which by the way, I recommend doing this with your own documents anyway, because nothing is, is more meaningful to you that those things that affect you. So like when we get to the contract, I recommend you pull out the documents when you bought your house and go through them as we're going through the contract. Pull out your deed. Now I'm, I'm, I'm gonna say something, I'm not gonna ask anybody to indicate, but the fact is, Fully 90% of people that buy a house have never read their deed, never even looked at it. And I can't understand how somebody could spend $200,000, $500,000, $700,000 on something and not read the most important instrument there is, and that's the deed. But that's what people do. And if you read those documents, you will not find the word home, house, dwelling, structure, that's not there. It talks about the land and all improvements. And the word improvement encompasses everything that we do to land, we being the general mankind, humankind. We landscape, we clear, we build, we plant. So it's all about the land. Now, we're talking about what is real property. And I was already mentioned real property is actually a legal term. Real property is the land, everything attached to it. That would include your house, garage, driveway, whatever was done to the land. And most importantly, all interests, rights, and benefits of ownership. That's what real property is. In other words, when I talk about real property, it includes things you cannot see and cannot hold in your hand. Yet, they are the most important part 
of the ownership because without those, you might as well not own the land. All interest, rights, benefits of ownership. And we'll talk about these things as we go through the course. Now, the legal way of saying that, and I've already used the word uh, in the introduction, I use the word legalese, okay? So the legal way of saying interest rights, benefits of ownership is lands, tenements, and hereditaments. Okay. That's the rights and benefits. And that's the legal way of saying it. Now, real property is transferred using a deed. Now, the picture in the book, I'm going to break up into three pieces just so we can look at it a little bit at a time. So the first thing we have is the land. And they have a representation of Earth with this wedge in it. And of course, if you own that wedge, you own all of North America or something. But it's the only way you can, you can get enough of it to see. So when we own land, the question is, what do we really own? Well, we own the surface, and we own that surface down to the center of the earth. And we own the airspace above the land, including the trees and water. We own everything that's on the land naturally. Okay, that's land. And we have rights in all that. We have rights in the surface, rights in what's in the ground, rights in the air above the land. That's land. Real estate is the second step. Real estate includes the physical improvements, the things you and I do to it. We clear, we landscape, we plant, we build. In the picture, they show adding a home. Of course, it could be a shopping center or a warehouse or an office building. So real estate, the term is land plus the permanent man-made additions. And then the final step is where we get into the real property because the real property includes the intangibles. The real property includes the rights we get in the land. So these are rights that everybody who owns land has in the land. And it's called the bundle of rights or the bundle of legal rights. And it's always pictured as a, a bundle of limbs, branches, twigs, sticks. That's how it's symbolized, okay? Now, we'll come back to the bundle of rights. We'll look at them individually. But the next thing we're gonna look at is land has characteristics. It actually has two sets of characteristics. One set are physical characteristics. Okay, land is immobile. Okay, mobile means you can move it like a mobile phone, but land is immobile. You can't move it. I don't care how gargantuan a tractor you hook up with big giant hooks dug down into the ground, you cannot drag that ground somewhere else. It's immovable. Land is indestructible. You can't destroy it. I don't care how much TNT you pile up on it, <clears throat> nitroglycerin, plastique, and you blow it up. The land is still there. The best that will happen, the best you can do is you'll make a dent in it. You might end up with a crater. You'll make a dent in it. But the land is still there. 
you can't destroy it. And finally, every single parcel of land is absolutely unique. Now, unique isn't a word we tend to use a lot. So would someone like to tell me what the word unique means? Before you look it up on your phone, I mean. Um, it means different from everything else, like not the same. Exactly, that's it. So, and, and see, um, if you stopped with different, that's not quite it. There's a lot of things different, but see, Aaron didn't stop, he kept going. Different from everything else. Or another way to put unique, it's one of a kind. It's the only piece of land like it. Let me describe it to you this way. If I had a 10 acre parcel of land and it's perfectly flat and the only thing growing on it is grass, it's a pasture, 10 acres, no trees, no, no plants, shrubs, flowers, just grass. And I get a surveyor to break that up into 10 one acre lots. When I walk across the 10 acres, I can't tell when I'm leaving one one acre lot and entering the next one. Yet, every single one of those one acre lots is absolutely unique from every other one and every other piece of land on earth. Now, what makes it unique? There's one quality that this is, why this is true, why every piece of land is absolutely unique from every other. What makes it unique? There'll never be a land that's the same. That's true, but why? Oh, why? It's the only okay. one there is. Okay, not quite there yet. What's underneath? No. Location. Location. I can pull a latitude and longitude, and every one is different. It's in a different place. As a matter of fact, with the technology we have, I've got a compass app I can open on my phone and it will constantly update latitude and longitude as I walk. You know, if you go back probably just 20 or 25 years ago, you'd have to use a sextant. We didn't have these things. The first smartphone was an Apple, okay, the iPhone. And this is a 12, they're up to a 13. So the Apple iPhone was the first smartphone, not the first phone, but first smartphone. And it's in its 13th year. That's how they numbered them, if you never figured that out. So we've had a smartphone for 13 years. We had, <laughs> uh, most of you probably won't even know what this is. Before the smartphone, we had PDAs personal digital assistant, okay? And some of them would kind of be a phone. They weren't very good phones, but they were great. Uh, you could put your contacts in it and all that kind of stuff. And before that, we didn't have any. When I first got in the business of real estate, we didn't have mobile phones. I had to make my calls before I left the house, or if I needed to make a call while I was out, I had to go to the office. There were no mobile phones. But today, it's so simple. So what makes land unique is its location because there's no other one like it, okay? Now, there's two other words that you could possibly see, maybe on an exam, and I'm not saying they're there, I'm saying you need to be prepared. 
okay? But there's two other words that mean the same thing as unique. And they are heterogeneity and non-homogeneity. And they're there in parentheses at the end of the line. Now, since these are kind of the first really weird words we're seeing, okay? Let me explain something to you. You don't have to know how to spell anything. And you don't have to know how to pronounce anything. Because all 120 questions on both exams are multiple choice. So what you need to be able to do is to recognize the words if they're in a question or a multiple choice answer. Okay? So don't, don't let this throw you. You just have to be able to recognize it if you see it. You see one of these two words, oh, I know what that means, unique. Now, the second set of characteristics are the economic ones. In other words, these are the things that are going to affect the value. How much is it worth? Okay. And the first one is scarcity. <clears throat> Now, if we take land as a whole, just all the land in the world, as much as we have of it, it's scarce because it's all we have of it. What I'm saying is you can't manufacture land. I know that some countries have gone to great expense to reclaim land from the ocean, but that's not actually making it, manufacturing it. We don't have land factories. So we're limited to the land we have, which makes it valuable right there. But scarcity is also a relative thing. Okay. If I ask you, what kind of land do you think might be scarce, more scarce than other kinds? What do you think of? Waterfront, Newburn. That's that's all, it's almost, almost always the first one people think of, and you're right, okay? But it's not the only kind of, of scarce land. Uh, what about golf course? What about mountain view? You know, so all land, my point is, all land is scarce. Some land is more scarce than others. Now, here's an example. If I'm looking for a 40 acre parcel, I want to buy a 40 acre parcel so I can develop a subdivision. If I go to Pamlico County, I can buy 40 acre parcels in Pamlico County all day long for probably six to $8,000 an acre. As long as it's not on the water, of course, okay? But, and the reason I can do that is because there's lots of land available in Pamlico County. You know, people don't take up a lot of room there. There's only 14,000 people in Pamlico County. And the reason I know that is because we lived there for 15 years. The interesting thing is there were 14,000 people in Pamlico County in 1940 and 50 and 60, 70, 80, 90, there's still 14,000 people give or take a few. So there's plenty of land. It's readily available, which makes it relatively inexpensive. But what if I go to Mecklenburg County? That's Charlotte. So listen, if I can find a 40 acre parcel, I literally may not be able to find a 40 acre parcel. But if I can find it, it's going to be $50,000 an acre. Because 40-acre parcels in Mecklenburg County or Wake County, Raleigh, are scarce. They're really scarce. They're almost non-existent. So all land is scarce, but scarcity is also a relative thing, depending on what the land is. 
Now, the second economic characteristic is location. And if you think about it, that's tied to scarcity. What makes waterfront property scarce? Well, it's located on the water, you know? Um, so location and scarcity are closely related, not the same. And of course, most people have heard the old real estate axiom, location, 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 which by the way, isn't always true, but at any rate. So that's the second economic, where is it? Is it on the water? Is it on the golf course? Does it have a beautiful view of Grandfather Mountain? Okay. Or Lake Lure? The next one are the things we do to it. Improvements. Now, you got to be a little careful with this. Because improvement doesn't quite mean what we think it means when we use it. Here's, here's what I'm trying to say. Whatever we do to the land, whatever we add to it is an improvement. We landscape, we grade, we clear, we plant, we build. Most of the time, if we use the word improve or improvement, in conversation, the way we typically use it is to make it better, right? Let's improve the ball field. There's too many rocks in the, in the base path. Let's improve the ball field, make it better. Well, that's not what it means here. Because even if somebody comes in and does something really, really stupid with the land, it's still an improvement. Not because it's better, but because they added something to the land. Does that make sense? I mean, the truth is sometimes people buy land, they put something on the land, shouldn't be there. So it actually hurts the value instead of raising the value, but the word is still improvement. That's the word you'll find in your sales contract when you bought your house. That's the word you'll find in your deed. The land and all permanent man-made improvements. And then finally, the last one, permanence of investment. Now, permanence of investment uh, is like a two-sided coin. And as we go through the course, there's, there's just a handful, maybe four different items where I'll describe them like a two-sided coin. There's two sides to, to this, okay? They're both the same thing, but two different perspectives, two different ways of looking at it, let's say. Yeah, I'm not gonna eat from Okay, so let's look at our perspective. Consumers. We want to buy a house. We want to buy a piece of land with a house on it, okay? We are willing to get that house. We are willing to make a long-term commitment, 30 years, sometimes more, to make large payments over the whole 30 years. And we're willing to do that. We're willing to sign on the dotted line. Why? because we know in 30 years, it's still gonna be there. Our investment is permanent. So guess what the flip side of the coin is? The other perspective is the lender's perspective. For the very same reason, they are willing to give us all that money because they know their investment, and the word they would probably use is collateral, but they know in 30 years, it'll still be there. So we're willing to borrow the money and make that long-term commitment, and the lender's willing to give us the money for that long-term because at the end of the 30 years or 40 years or however long it is, it's still gonna be there, it's permanent.
Now, the, the four point bullet right under that reads general concept of land use and investment. And we're not going to spend a whole lot of time on these. I'm just kind of going to go through them because every single one of them comes up again later in the course. And when it does, we'll spend time on it and get deeper into it. This is just an introduction to the general concepts. First, highest and best use. The reasonably probable and legal use that is physically possible, financially feasible, and results in the highest value. So legal would be zoning, physically possible, the land is flat enough, financially feasible, it makes, spend, it makes sense to either borrow and or spend the money. And after doing all those things, what we do to it is gonna end up with the highest value. In other words, we're not gonna do something stupid on the land. Next, we have public and private land use restrictions. Zoning is an example of public land use restriction. It's something that restricts our use of the land. We can only put a single family home on that land. Can't put a restaurant, it's not zoned right. So zoning is public, restricted covenants is private. Now, um, we'll say this again two or three times as we go through the course, but this is the first time. The word public means government and the word private is not government. That's literally what it means. No matter what you're talking about, if it's in real estate, public means government and private means not government. Whether that's federal government, state government, city government, county government, it's government. Real estate as an investment, okay? So someone who's really going to invest in real estate buys the real estate to hold for appreciation in value and to generate cash flow. So Karen mentioned earlier, one of the things they had in mind doing is flipping. And there's nothing wrong with flipping. You can make money flipping, but it's not investing. Investing means you buy the property and you hold it 10 or 20 years. But even that's not true investing. True investing is while you're holding it, you generate cash flow. So how do you generate cash flow? How do you generate a cash flow with, with real estate? Every month, somebody's going to pay you money. How do you do that? I just gave you the big clue. Rent. 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 I'm trying to unmute. Rent. Okay. That's why when we're talking about rental properties, we call them investment properties, literally. Scope of real estate business. We have residential, we have commercial. We have sales and lease in both of those. And we have property management managing other people's rentals, not our own rentals, somebody else's rentals. And finally, the real estate market is local in nature. Okay. What they do in Greenville doesn't affect New Bern. Doesn't affect Raleigh. Real estate market is local, wherever you are. So when you turn over to page two, another four point bullet, concept of real property, okay? And the basic definition 
is kind of what we saw at the top of page one. Land, everything attached permanently, and that's called improvements, and the interest, rights, and benefits of ownership. Without the rights, the interests, you don't own anything. And we have another picture of the bundle of legal rights. Again, always pictured as a bundle of sticks, twigs, branches, whatever you notice in, in this picture. And even on the picture uh, back on page one, they actually have leaves at the end of them. And they always picture five because there's five basic rights you have in, in land, possession, control, enjoyment, exclusion, and disposition. Now, there's always a reason something is represented a certain way, pictured a certain way, if you want symbolized a certain way. So why in the world did they pick a bunch of twigs to represent these rights and land? It's gotta be a reason. So here's the background. Real, as quick as I can. If you go back several hundred years in England, they had what was called a feudal system. Okay? And the easiest way to think about how the feudal system works, think of the Robin Hood stories. They're actually pretty historically accurate as far as how things work. And it's real simple to understand. The king owns everything. The reigning monarch owns everything. Now, when I say owns everything, it's easy to understand the king owns all the land, literally all the land from the Atlantic Ocean to the English Channel to the North Sea. But see, it goes way beyond that. What's on the land? Trees. They're the king's trees. That's why if a subject cut one down, they could, they could be hung or whatever they did to them. The animals graze on the grass, they were the king's deer. That's why I say the Robin Hood stories were pretty accurate. The king literally owned everything. And see, from the king's perspective, since Everyone that lived in England lived off the land. They grew a crop or they raised an animal. They basically grew, were living off the land and how they lived was at the king's graces. In other words, it was the king's grass and the king's plants and the, you know everything was the king's. So when the king collected taxes, the king was being generous. We're looking through the king's eyes now. Nobody else in England thought that. But the king was being generous because the king was allowing the people to keep part of what they had that was rightfully his. Or he taking it all away from them. This is how the king viewed it. Now, although the king owned all the land, once in a great while, he would grant a piece of land to a subject that did something really good for him. Now, back then, okay, the, you know, the 400s through the 1200s or wherever this is, doesn't matter. But back then, doing something really good for the king typically meant you raised an army, you sailed over to France, Portugal, Spain, you killed, you maimed, you stole, you pillaged, and you brought it all back and gave most of it to the king. As a reward, the king would do two things. The king, the, I'm going to tell you the second one first because it makes the first one more important. The king is going to grant a piece of land to this individual for all the good stuff he did. 
and helping to fill the king's treasury. He's going to piece of, give him a piece of land, but he can't give him a piece of land until he gives him something else first. Anybody want to guess what the king gave to this person first? Title. Duke, Earl, Lord, whatever it was, he gave them a title. Because you can't hold land without title. And to this day, we call it title. And that's where that comes from. So there were no surveys. Surveys weren't invented to the time of Henry VIII. There were no surveys. There was no way to describe land. So the king would send uh, somebody from the court, representative, and this individual who now holds the title that's being given this land and the king's representative would ride around the land. So there was no question, this is yours, but everything outside, that's the king's. And when they had finished the circuit, the representative of the king would ride up to a tree growing on the land and symbolically rip branches off the tree and hand them to this person. And every branch represented another right, bundle of legal rights, where it's come from. And guess what? Some of them got more branches than others. Some of them had more rights in the land than others. But the one right they never got was disposition. That means dispose of the land, sell it, will it, give it. The only right they had was to will. But if they didn't want the land anymore, it then went back to the king. And by the way, this right to will the land, this is why having a male heir was such a huge deal in England, even to the king. Because a female could not inherit. A female couldn't own land. As a matter of fact, sorry, ladies, female were called chattel, personal property. Okay, that was it. So this is why if this knight or whatever they were died, if they didn't have a male heir, the whole family had to leave the land. They had to give it up. And there's even stories, probably, probably true, I don't know, but stories I've read where since they had five daughters and no sons, they, you know, they got one of the daughters to volunteer and she cut her hair and started wearing men's clothes to pass her off as a son so there'd be an heir. But that's where all this symbolism comes from. To this day, we call ownership of land title. To this day, it's the bundle of legal rights. Okay, so we try and give you memory tools as we go through this, and the memory tool for the, the bundle of rights is deep C. Disposition, the right to dispose of the land, to sell it, to give it away, to will it. The right of disposition. Enjoyment. Now, enjoyment doesn't mean the traditional way we use it today, have fun, party hardy, okay? Enjoyment was a legal term, and well, still is a legal term, that means enjoy all the rights of ownership without interruption. The best way I can actually explain enjoyment, it's peace of mind. The owner has peace of mind. Nobody's going to come and take it away from them. They don't have to worry about that. Okay. Exclusion. Now, exclusion can be obvious. We may be able to exclude others from our property. We may be able to put up a fence, build a wall, not many people dig a moat anymore, okay? But we can exclude others from it. But it has another meaning also. 
the ownership rights are exclusive to the person holding title. Or let me turn that around. The person holding title has excluded all others from owning it. That's another way you can talk about exclusion. And then possession. Possession. The right to use the property, the right to occupy the property, the right to live on the property. And control. Not only to control the land and what happens on it, but to control the profits of the land. So if it is an investment property to control the rent, if you're growing a crop to control the crop, and that's the bundle of legal rights. All right. Another legal term, a pertinence, a pertinence, rights, privileges and or improvements. So if you're reading what's in the book and a pertinence can be tangible, physical, such as an improvement, driveway or utilities, okay. So an appurtenance is a right, privilege, or improvement. Or it can be intangible. And again, if you're reading in the book, air rights, water rights, subsurface rights, like mineral rights, those are appurtenances, okay? Now, they convey with land ownership. Convey, again, is a legal term for transfer or even more basically go with. You sell the land, the appurtenances convey with the land. They go with it, okay? The another way you can phrase this is that they run with the land. It's another way to say it run with the land. They may be severed from the land and sold separately. Okay. And severed is a word that means separated or cut. So as an example, I could sell my mineral rights to somebody. I could sell air rights actually. And we'll talk about these. Okay. So severed. And the word severed means cut or separate. Now, if I was going to give you one word that conveys to you, passes to you, what the word appurtenance means, that word would be the word benefit. So in the margin, just to the left of the arrow in front of the word appurtenances, write the word benefit. In other words, it's a good thing. It's a positive thing. And appurtenance is the benefit to the land, not to the person. Now, the person, as long as they own the land, will benefit from the appurtenance, but when they sell the land, the appurtenances go with the land, not the person. Rights of ownership. The rights of ownership may be severed and transferred separately from the land. Okay. You could sell or lease the oil and gas rights. If you sold them, you'd actually there'd be a deed for the oil and gas rights, or you could lease them with the lease. And then the land can still be sold. It's just those rights wouldn't go with the land. Now, some of you live in the New Bern area. And what I'm going to talk about it is all over the country. But it, the, the neighborhoods I'm familiar with are in the New Bern area because that's where I live now. 
there are certain properties that when you buy a house in a subdivision, you don't get the mineral rights. Somebody ahead of you reserved them. And what I'm talking about is any land that was originally warehouser property. Warehouser bought up huge chunks of land, mainly for the trees. They harvest the trees when they're mature. And then they sell the land. And typically they sell the land to developers. Warehouser always reserves the mineral rights to themselves. So three obvious neighborhoods in the New Bern area, and there's more neighborhoods, this is just the three I'm really familiar with, Greenbrier, Taberna, Carolina Colors. None of the people who live in those neighborhoods have their mineral rights. Warehouser still holds them. Now, do they know that? I venture to say 90% of them don't know that. You want to guess why 90% of those people don't know that? Because they didn't look at their deed. Yes, exactly. Because it's in their deed. And it's obvious. It's like three paragraphs long. but they don't read their deed. So that's an, an example of how this happens, okay? Now, because of this, and also because the North Carolina General Assembly in 2012 legalized the practice of hydraulic fracturing, now, you probably know it by its slang name, fracking. Okay, so in 2012, the North Carolina General Assembly legalized fracking in the state of North Carolina. Now, understand this. They weren't asked to do that. What I mean by that is no oil company lobbied for it. No oil company asked for it. No oil company has done anything with it not even explore, but they passed the law, okay? So because North Carolina legalized the practice of fracking, most residential sellers are required to disclose the status of the mineral and oil and gas rights. There's actually a form you fill out. It's in the documents I sent you. We'll look at it, we'll go through it. It includes new construction but not raw land. The law simply doesn't address the sale of land. Disclosure must be given to purchasers of most residential properties. Now, this is a real estate commission video about what I just shared with you. If you call North Carolina home, you know that our state is rich in natural resources. In certain areas of the state, those resources are underground as well as above. If you notice where the big green area is, it's in the middle of the state. Okay, so it, it includes the city of Durham, Wake County's over here to the right, and it goes on down through Anson County. And then there's a this this area up here is along the Dan River. And those are the two only two areas they think they would find enough natural gas to make it worth their while. Now, who decided that? I have no clue. At any rate. Now, you've probably heard about state laws passed in 2012 regulating oil and gas exploration. New technology allows extraction of natural gas from previously inaccessible deposits underground using a process called hydraulic fracturing or fracking. Real estate brokers, buyers, and sellers need to know about fracking and the required disclosures that will be in your real estate contract. 
So what is fracking and how does it work? Fracking starts with drilling a deep well down into the ground, hundreds or even thousands of feet below the land surface. Then the drilling moves sideways, stretching as far as a mile. Water and chemicals are pumped through the well at high pressure. This is what fractures the shale rock, releasing the natural gas. So how does this affect your real estate transaction? Well, it's possible for a company to own oil and gas rights underneath the property, while someone else owns the land on top. In this scenario, when the owner of the surface property decides to sell, the oil and gas rights are not included because they belong to someone else. This means that the buyer will own the surface property, but not the oil or gas that might be below. Suppose you want to buy a particular property. You might want to know whether it includes the subsurface rights. State law now requires most sellers to disclose this in the sales contract. This disclosure cannot be waived. Are there transactions where no disclosure is required? Well, sure, a few. The exceptions to the disclosure include court-ordered and estate sales, sales between co-owners, and lease with option to purchase contracts, but only when the tenant occupies the property. Now, another important exception to the disclosure requirement is vacant land. The new law just doesn't address it. If you are buying land or you are a broker representing someone buying vacant land, you should investigate whether the property includes oil and gas rights. Unless the real estate sale is covered by one of the exceptions, Chapter 47E of the North Carolina General Statutes requires the seller to answer three specific questions in the real estate contract. One, have the oil and gas rights been severed from the property by a previous owner? Two, has the seller personally severed the rights from the property in the past? And three, does the seller intend to sever the subsurface rights from the property prior to closing? Now, what if the seller doesn't know whether or not the prior owner separated the gas rights from the property? The seller can make no representation about what the prior owner did. In that case, the buyer should have an attorney assist in checking the land title records for more information. Now, even though a seller is allowed to make no representation about what a prior owner did, the seller must disclose whether he or she personally severed the subsurface rights or intends to do so prior to closing. If you have questions about fracking, there are a lot of great resources. You can find bulletin articles on our website under Publications. You can read the new fracking law on the General Assembly's website by searching hydraulic fracturing. And to see a CNN video, go to YouTube and search CNN Explains Fracking. Okay. So, there's a diagram that probably uh, really, in a simple way, makes clear what we're talking about. We own the surface of the land, we owe what, own what's in the ground down to the center of the earth, and we have rights in the air above our property. Now, we cannot encroach on the air rights of others like the neighbors, which is what that last picture is on the bottom of page two. Now, most homeowners, property owners, typically don't do anything about a situation like that. Um, you know, we, we had a whole line of trees that came over a fence between our properties when we lived in Charlotte. And we enjoyed that because it gave shade and coolness to the yard. Nonetheless, that is an encroachment. Um, now, what's not talked about, which is actually a worse problem, is if you look at the bottom of the fence, there's a huge root that's coming through the fence. That I would complain about because it's tearing up my fence. But we're talking about air rights right now. Now, the right to use space above the land to a reasonable height, that's what air rights are. We can't restrict air traffic or solar or wind power. Okay. And, you know, let's be practical, realistic. Percentage wise, very few people live in close proximity to airports. Now, obviously, some people do. And all this diagram is demonstrating is that the height of the aircraft controls the height of buildings, depending on where they are in the glide slope. So the closer you buy to the airport, the lower your building's gonna have to be. Um, when you fly into the big airports, Charlotte, Atlanta, any large airport, when you're really close to the airport, 
plane's already got their landing gear down and you're going to land in the next minute or so. What kind of buildings do you see around the airport? Almost all of them are the same. Single story flat roof buildings, warehouses, trucking companies, that's what you see. Because they don't infringe on the air rights. And see, it works for them, the buildings, I mean, and it complies with the air rights. Now, in cities, it is not unheard of for one owner to sell their air rights to another owner, which is what this picture is depicting. So you've got these new office buildings going up. You've got this older building between them, okay? And they either don't want to sell or maybe it's historic. At any rate, the owner of that building is not using all their air rights. In other words, the height set by zoning law. In many municipalities, they can take those air rights, sell them to a neighboring property owner, and they can take them and tack them up on top of the legal line, which is what, exactly what's being depicted in the picture, thereby raising the height of how high they can build. Just showing you different ways air rights are, are play into real estate. One last example. They say that the most photographed building that's ever been, it's not the Empire State Building, it's the MetLife Building. And what's unique about the MetLife Building is the owners of the MetLife Building don't own any land. What they did was, when it was originally built, and it was originally built, so I'm going I'm to switch the picture. It was originally built as the Pan Am building, Pan American Airlines. Pan American Airlines bought the air rights from the Pennsylvania Railroad. Pennsylvania Railroad at that time owned Grand Central Station, which is underground. And that's still there. So the owner of the building does not own any land. The owner of the building owns air rights that they purchased from the Pennsylvania Railroad originally. When Pan American Airlines went bust, MetLife, the insurance company, purchased it. So it's now the MetLife building. Also, notice the roof. It's a flat, elevated, with a uh, lip around it. It's a heliport. So it's one of the places you can take a helicopter from the three major airports in New York and fly to and be right downtown at any rate. Again, demonstrating the use of air rights. What about water? How does it work when you own a home on the water, okay? When land adjoins or is adjacent to water? Well, it depends on what kind of water it is. So, the general term for all water rights you typically hear, at least on the East Coast, is riparian rights. Notice the word riparian starts with an R, as does river, starts with an R. So riparian rights are smaller bodies of water like rivers and streams. And the real key is they're non-tidal. They don't have high and low tides. And the reason they don't have high and low tides is because they're not big enough. You know, the high and low tides are mainly caused by the gravity of the moon. As the moon swings around the earth, going over, it pulls the water. And then when, the, when it gets too far away, it releases the water and the water comes back in. That's where the tides come from, the gravity of the moon, for the most part. 
Well, rivers and streams aren't big enough to be affected by the gravity of the moon, so they're called non-tidal waters. They don't have tides. Now, got this nice river, built some beautiful homes on the river bank. What do those people own to? Now, I want you to commit this to memory, okay? There is an answer that almost every single question you ask in real estate and almost every single question you will ever ask an attorney, they have the same answer. Does anybody know what that answer is? You ask an attorney a question? It depends. It depends. So what do they own to? It depends. If the water is navigable, that's why I'm showing the, the little fishing boat on the water. If the water can be navigated and it doesn't have to be a certain size boat, okay? It can be a one person kayak. If the water's navigable, they own to the edge of the water. The land under the water is owned by the state of North Carolina. It's public land. as is the water. That's why anybody has the right to boat on the water. Anybody has the right to fish on the water. And one of the reasons we moved down to Pamlico and bought uh, a house on Riggs Creek was I love to fish. And he loves to ride, ride in the boat. She's not a fisher, but she loves to ride in the boat. I have 17 foot center console. And I would go up some of those creeks, streams, and people lived on some of them, and I would be casting my lure under their pier, and they would actually come out in their backyard and give me dirty looks. In other words, it was like I was stealing their fish. You know, the fish under the pier belonged to them. But they don't. They belong to the state of North Carolina. They're public. Anybody can have them. So what you need to remember is riparian rights applies to rivers and streams, and that's because they're non-tidal. If the water is navigable, if you can boat on it, the owner owns the edge of the water, the water and the land is owned by the state. Now, so this is actually an aerial view of Riggs Creek I just named, okay? And... You see my red dot? This was the house we owned down there for 15 years. There's the pier. This is a Google Earth shot. And it, it's either from before I bought the boat or after I sold the boat. Because it always sat at the end of the dock. And this is actually three, three lots that were on the, on, they're still on the market. Nobody's buying them. Okay. And the, this creek, uh, where we were was approximately 250 feet wide, and it was six feet deep at the center. But it's navigable. So we own to the edge of the water. Non-navigable, the owner owns to the center of the water. Now, you have to be realistic about this. This assumes that the water's on the property line, the stream or creek or whatever it is on the property line. So if it's not navigable, you can't put a boat on it, then the owners own to the center of the water. Aerial shot of non-navigable creek going through the farm fields. Now, I said something a couple minutes ago when I described riparian rights, I said at least on the East Coast. The Western states don't use riparian rights. The Western states use what's called the doctrine of prior appropriation. Okay, 
prior appropriation. So remember that part of the exam, actually the largest part of the exam is a national. So you could get questions about this. Western states follow the doctrine of prior appropriation. Water rights are determined by priority of beneficial use. In English, the first person to use the water for something owns the water, not literally, but owns the right to the water. It doesn't matter where they are on the water. So as an example, the first person to draw water off to irrigate a field, they now own the right to use that water. Okay. First person or entity to use or divert water for a beneficial use like agriculture or industry can acquire individual rights to the water. Property owners may own land that borders water but have no right to use that water. And a good example of this, and I can't give you all the details is too uh, complicated. Lake Mead that was formed by the Hoover Dam, Colorado River, that water is 90% appropriated away from the state of Nevada where the dam's located. Most of it goes to California and Mexico because they struck a deal when the dam was built. The water's appropriated. So Western states use prior appropriation. Eastern states use reasonable uh, repairing rights. And the picture I just popped up is in your book on the bottom of three. I know it's not the easiest thing to read, but once you know what it says, it's pretty, pretty clear. So even though what's in the picture at the top of the picture, junior user, they bought the land in 1970, they can't take any of the water. It doesn't mean, you know, if it's swimmable, it doesn't mean they can't swim or boat, but they can't take the water. They can't draw it off the irrigated field, for example, because the people who got the right in 1910 own the right. Prior, the word prior means before. And we use the word all through real estate. He used the in the video about the, the fracking, he used the word prior about a dozen times. Just means before. The other kind of water rights are the rights you have when you live on the ocean or large lakes. Now, when I say large lakes, I mean like the Great Lakes. You see the Great Lakes are so big, they do have high and low tides. They are affected by the gravity of the moon. So it works differently. So the next time when you walk down the beach, and you see the pretty homes along the beach, you'll know what they actually own to, okay? They own to the mean high watermark. You walk down the beach, usually, most of the time, you can tell where the last high tide came into because it leaves that fine line on the sand. That's what they own to. Below that line is owned by the state of North Carolina and it's public. Everybody has a right to use it. And it has a name. It's called the foreshore. I'm sure the locals probably say for sure, but it's called the foreshore. So there's an aerial shot where you can see where the tide came into and the people that own these homes, that's what they own to. This is why they get so upset after a bad storm and it washes the sand away because it moves the high tide mark. 
literally, uh, there have been some cases where it removes so much sand that the high tide mark ends up either under the house or behind the house, if you have a house on stilts. This happened on Galveston Island in the Gulf. City of Galveston, Texas, there's an island called Galveston Island, long, narrow. It makes Emerald Isle look like, you know, 100 miles wide. It, it's just a finger of land. And on the, the western tip of Galveston Island, about a dozen homes had to be taken down. The homes survived the storm. But after the storm, so much sand was washed away that the mean high water mark was behind the house. So think about that. That means the house is now on state land, which is illegal. So they gave the people 90 days to move the house or it was gonna be knocked down. That's what you call the joy of ownership on the water. Nothing you can do about that. Nobody ever thinks about this. What do you call the insurance on your house, home? What do you call it? Homeowners, right? There is no such thing as land insurance. You can't insure your land. You insure your home. You insure the improvement. This is why fallen trees aren't covered. You know, you, you lose 1,200 year old oaks. You don't get a penny from the insurance company, not unless, that, not unless the tree falls on your house and then they'll fix the house, but they're not gonna replace any trees. They're not insured. You cannot insure a land. Now, because of shifting land boundaries, you can gain land from the action of water. An owner is entitled to land acquired by accretion, increase of land by soil deposited by water, usually washed from upstream to downstream, and it accumulates, or reliction. Reliction, new land appears before, because water dries up. It changes direction, it dries up, it recedes. So, accretion on the Avon River. Lot one, original line, is the dotted line. But because this dirt has been building up over time, once it stabilizes, the owner of lot one now owns a larger lot through a process known as accretion. Reliction, water recedes, dries up and exposes land like that. And if that land stabilizes and dries out, the owner of that land will own that land too. I would like to point out, however, he probably would rather have the water back so he can use his pontoon boat. That's actually a cove on Lake Superior. Reliction. Now, what is more common actually is you can lose land through the action of water. An owner can lose land through, land through erosion. Gradual wearing away of land by the natural action of water. Emphasis on the word gradual takes time. Avulsion, on the other hand, is sudden, even violent. Tearing away of land by earthquake, flood, hurricane, changing the course of a stream or river, it's sudden and violent. So erosion, most people know what erosion is. They, they know it when they see it and it takes time. And if it's caught early, it can be remedied. The earlier you, you catch it, the easier and less expensive it is to remedy, but it can be remedied. You fill it in, you divert the water so it doesn't run down that trench. What is the biggest example 
we have in the United States of erosion. Ever been to the Grand Canyon? I think they estimate it took 33 million years. I was only there for the second half of it. <laughs> There's avulsion. You're looking at Harris Island. And what you're looking at happened in about four hours. You might know the lady's name. Isabel. 2003, September, Isabel. Isabel was harder on the outer banks. Irene in 2011 was harder on the inner banks. That's the one that got us. We were out of our home for nine months after Irene rebuilding it. Lateral and subjacent support. Owners have the right to have the sides and surface of their land supported by neighboring properties. And this can be done by the use of retaining walls. And usually what this is actually referring to is development. When developers buy up land to develop, put in a, a subdivision and some commercial endeavor, they actually have to do studies to make sure if they're going to move any of that land that it's not going to affect neighboring properties. And there have been cases where it has affected it and it costs them a fortune because houses start slipping off foundations and they have to make all that right. It's called lateral and subjacent support. Lateral is side to side, subjacent is underneath. Okay. Let's take our second break. Okay. We are on the top of page five. And we're going to start talking about personal property. Personal property, everything that is not real property. When you're dealing with legal items frequently, when you define one item and then you move to the second item, you get this kind of definition where we define real property definitively in, in three different ways. But when we move to personal property, the definition of personal property is simple. Everything that is not real property. Personal property is movable. Does not usually convey. You sell your house, your personal property usually doesn't go with it. Okay, it doesn't convey. Also known as chattel or personal estate. And they're actually at the top of the page on the four point bullet. Chattel or personality. And you heard me use the word chattel when I was giving, giving you that background from the, uh, the old system in England. Chattel is an old English word for, for personal property. And a lot of the instructors as a memory tool use the word cattle. They tell you to think of cattle because you can buy and sell cattle. Chattel means personal property, as does the word personal tea. And personal property is transferred by bill of sale. Okay. When's the last time you got a bill of sale? The last bill of sale I got was last night when I got two Whoppers at Burger King. It's called a receipt, okay? And the only reason we don't have the written bill of sale and we have the receipt is because of technology. It's a bill of sale. The property cycle. I want to fix this slide if you'll give me a second. Actually, I want to fix it whether you give me a second or not.
So in the book, I use just the pictures to show the property cycle, how something can start off as personal property, namely the pine seedlings. And I actually found that box of pine seedlings on the internet. It was a company that was selling the pine seedlings, there were 50 in a box. It's personal property. It's certainly movable, you can carry it around. But once you plug them into the ground, then they grow into pine trees, which are real property. Actually, as soon as they're in the ground, you tamp the dirt around them down, even as a seedling then, they're real property. They're in the ground. And then when the trees are mature, Weyerhaeuser comes in and harvests them and mills it. Some of it they mill for wood. The parts that can't be milled are ground up and turned into paper and other products. But the point is something that starts out as personal property and then is changed into real property and then is changed back into personal property. Fruits of the soil, plants and trees are called fructus naturales. Now, remember what I told you earlier. You don't have to know how to pronounce it. You don't have to know how to spell it because both exams, all the questions are multiple choice. You just have to be able to recognize it. Fructus naturales, fruits of nature both naturally occurring and man-made. So fructus naturalis refers to fruits of the soil, things that are planted, whether they God put them there or you put them there. Once they're in the ground, they're fructus naturalis. Agricultural crops, on the other hand, are called fructus industriales, fruits of industry, fruits of our industry. They also can be referred to as emblems, and I have that word there uh, at the end of the line. If you look up the word emblems in your dictionary app, it's going to tell you agricultural crops. Now, Here's the thing you have to be careful with, with agricultural crops. They're personal property. You plant an oak tree, once you put it in the ground or the pine trees I showed you, it becomes part of the real property. You plant an agricultural crop, it does not part, come become part of the real property. It's personal property, why? Because its only value is in the harvesting harvesting the fruit when it comes in, the corn, the soybeans, butter beans, whatever it is. Now, if someone's renting that land to grow that corn and the land gets sold, the tenant farmer still has the right to come back and harvest the corn. Why? Because he planted it. It's his, it's his personal property. Fixtures, an item that was personal property, but has been affixed or annexed, which simply means attached permanently to the real property. Usually when we use the word annex, we're talking about the city annexing land from the county. And that, but if you think about it, that's attaching the land to the city. So affixing or annexing an item permanently to the real property will then be part of the real property and convey when the real property is transferred. Now, 
if there's any discussion over whether something's a fixture or not, if there's a dispute, an argument, a court would use and we would use what's called the total circumstances test. And we give you another one of these acronyms, IRMA, intent. What was the intent of the person who attached the item? Was the intent to make it permanent? Or was the intent stated in the sales contract? What is the relationship of the individual? Now, not to the item in question. What's the relationship of the individual to the whole property, the real property? Meaning, do they own the real property or are they leasing the real property? If a tenant hangs a ceiling fan, likely as not, his intention is to remove the ceiling fan at the end of the lease and put whatever was that there back up. On the other hand, if the owner of the property hangs a ceiling fan, then his intent is certainly to make it permanent because it is a fixture and it will add value to the property. While a tenant could care less about adding value to the property, it's not their property. So what is the relationship of the person to the real property? Method of attachment. Is it nailed? Is it glued? Is it screwed? Would it deface the property to remove it? Then it's almost certainly a fixture. And adaptability, adapting something that normally wouldn't be a fixture to be a fixture. Now, there is legalese for method of attachment, okay? Character of the annexation. So if you read character of the annexation in an exam question, that's method of attachment. That's a question about fixtures. Character of the annexation. Of the four parts of IRMA, the most weight is always placed on intent. What was the intent of the person that attached the item? Now, regardless of anything else, whatever's in the contract will always rule how the item will be dealt with. Okay. We'll always determine how fixtures and personal property are being handled. Now, when it comes to determining if something's a fixture or not, three things don't matter at all. The size, the value, the location of the item are totally irrelevant. Doesn't affect it at all. So if it's screwed, glued, nailed, it's a fixture. You go to Lowe's and you buy the bathroom mirror. You go to Lowe's and you buy the ceiling fan. It's personal property. You take it to the register, you get a bill of sale in the form of a receipt. You take it home, assemble it, and hang it. It is now a fixture, part of the real property. And it conveys with the real property. So it changes from personal property to real property as a fixture. Adaptability. Refrigerators are personal property. They do not convey with the property unless a special arrangement's made. Unless it's been adapted to be real property, which usually involves building it into the cabinetry even to the point of having a facade or a fake front on it that actually matches the cabinets. Then it's a fixture. Then it's part of the real property. That's adaptability. Trade fixtures. Trade is a word for business. So a trade fixture is a fixture used in business. Fixtures under a commercial lease remain the property of the tenant. 
So if someone's leasing a space to conduct business in, I'm using a restaurant because there's lots of equipment in restaurants, and they attach things permanently in the lease space. No matter how permanent it's attached, at the end of the lease, the commercial tenant has the right to remove it. So the updraft system in the left picture, the hood and all its equipment, and the mushroom can, mushroom can on the top of the roof, they're permanently attached. They can be removed at the end of the lease. Now, when the tenant removes them, the tenant's gonna have to fix the roof. And most commercial leases will, will address when trade fixtures are removed, the property must be put in, back into the condition it was before they took possession. But the owner cannot prevent the removal of the trade fixtures. Agricultural fixtures, on the other hand, Fixtures under an agricultural lease belong to the landlord, the owner of the land, not to the tenant farmer. So the tenant farmer's tired of, tired of having to trailer these tractors back and forth, clears a little space, puts up a lean-to, sets it in concrete. That lean-to belongs to the landlord, the owner of the land, not to the tenant farmer. Tenant farmer's lease expires, they can't take the lean-to unless they've made an, an agreement with the owner. Now, the reason this is so is because in the law, farming is not considered a trade. Farming is treated differently from all other businesses. It's not considered a trade, so the trade fixture common law doesn't apply to it. And that's why it's done differently. There's an item called the Uniform Commercial Code, frequently referred to simply as UCC. If a homeowner purchases an item on credit with the security agreement, a contract, the item remains the personal property of the creditor until paid for. It can be removed by the creditor if the security agreement is breached. If this is a material fact that must be disclosed to everybody. So what we're talking about here is someone is gonna move in to a house, to an apartment, whatever. This can happen if they buy the house, this can happen if they rent a house, that doesn't matter. They go to, they need furniture, they have any furniture. So they go to Rooms to Go, because Rooms to Go is running a five room special. You can furnish five rooms for 2,400 bucks, whatever, okay? Whole package, whole enchilada. The whole kit and caboodle, the whole shebang. I've run out. At any rate, now there's two ways they could buy this. They could use a credit card, which today probably most people would do. And if they use a credit card, there is no security agreement. If you don't make the credit card payments, the credit card company's gonna make your life miserable. They're gonna hit your credit report. That's gonna bring your credit score down. They're gonna badger you. But the one thing the credit card company can't do is take the furniture because there's no security agreement. But some people either don't have a credit card or don't wanna use a credit card so they buy the furniture, what a lot of people would call the old fashioned way. They sign a contract. There's a contract between the person buying the furniture and the furniture store. And they sign this contract. 
when that contract is signed, the furniture store will file a uniform commercial code filing, UCC filing. And that gives them the right, if the person who bought the furniture breaches the agreement, whatever the, the contract says, you know, they go 45 days without a payment or they miss two payments, whatever that is, and rooms to go can come take the furniture. Used to happen a lot more often than it does today because of the advent of credit cards. What they used to call a repossession. So that's what the Uniform Commercial Code is. When attorneys do uh, the uh, title search, when you're transferring property, when attorneys do the title search, the title search will not bring up Uniform Commercial Code. They, they're supposed to check it, but it's a separate place. You check for these on the Register of Deeds, not the Register of Deeds, sorry, Secretary of State's website. On the Secretary of State's website is where you find the Uniform Commercial Code filings. Now, last thing on the bottom of seven, I already shared with you when we saw something similar up on page one. Private improvements on land are unique to that lot, like building a house. The improvement is made by the owner. Now understand at the time the house is built, the owner may be the builder, but the house is being built by the owner. Public improvements, is government, remember the word private means not government, word public means government. And this would be things like water and sewer systems, streets, sidewalks. Those are public improvements. They're made by the government. A manufactured home. Now, in the heading on the top of eight, I have in parentheses manufactured home, I have parentheses mobile. So what happened in 19, I think it was 76, you don't need to know the date, don't worry about it. But a long time ago, they changed the terminology. They took what was a mobile home and said from now on, we're gonna call this a manufactured home. So manufactured home and mobile home are the same thing, okay? And what distinguishes it is it has a permanent non-removable steel chassis. It's got the tongue that allows it to be towed and it's got an axle with wheels on it that allows it to be pulled. The fact is, it's a vehicle. When you buy one, you get a vehicle title, just like your car title. It's a vehicle, okay? It is not built to state building code. It meets HUD building code, Department of Housing and Urban Development. It has a certification label on the rear exterior. And the reason I put certification label in red is because the label is typically red. I've seen exceptions, but most of the time it's red. I'm going to show you a picture of it in a minute. It has a data plate inside. Now, here's um, the way words are used interests me, and I know that's the English major in me. However, the thing on the outside, the rear exterior, is called a certification label. It's a label. Now, when you hear the word label, what do you think of? What kind of material? Label on a jar. Paper, right? Well, the certification label's metal. Inside, there's a data plate. Well, what's a plate? It's something hard, stamped in metal. Guess what the data plate is? It's paper. So they're backwards. Typically, the data plate is found glued to a wall in a spare closet, put up just like a piece of wallpaper, okay? 
Manufactured homes are regulated by the DMV. Like I said, they have a vehicle title. They have a VIN number. Now, there's the data plate that you would find on the rear exterior of a manufactured home. By the way, if it's a double wide, each one has its own data plate because each one is a separate vehicle. You actually get two titles, two VIN numbers. Now I'm gonna blow the plate up for you, the label rather, okay? So only thing I want you to know because a lot of real estate agents misunderstand this. A lot of real estate agents think that the number stamped in the plate there you're looking at is the VIN number, and it's not. That's simply a number the manufacturer put on there when it came off the assembly line. As an example, if it is a double wide, the two plates will be in numeric sequence. One will be end in seven five, and the other one will be seven four or seven six. It'll be a numeric sequence. The VIN number is actually stamped in the steel frame under the mobile home. Now, the data plate inside looks like that. And it got a little blurry when I blew it up. But it actually, in, in the right hand column, it actually has information about the structure of the home. It will tell you the size of the wall studs. It will tell you how much they're on center. Uh, it will tell you some information about roof loading. And then the maps typically address temperature. So a mobile home you buy in North Carolina isn't insulated as well as a mobile home you buy in Wisconsin. It's colder up there. So it shows you the area of the country that the mobile home is insulated for. Now, manufactured homes are personal property. They're vehicles. Unless they are personal property unless you need to do three things so you can treat them as real property. The tongue, axle, and wheels are permanently removed. Now, if you remove the axle, the wheels have to go with it because the wheels are on the axle, but I just, I throw the, the wheels in just to make it clear. Permanently removed, and it's placed on a permanent foundation, and an affidavit is submitted to the DMV canceling the title. If all three of those things happen, then the mobile home can be treated as real property. Okay. So in this picture, you can clearly see the wheels. You can clearly see the tongue. You can see the steel frame. It's a mobile home. It's a vehicle. It's personal property. On the other hand, this double wide tongue, axle, wheels are gone. It's on a permanent foundation and an affidavit was submitted to the DMV canceling the title. Now, let me make something really clear. When you do these three things, that allows us to treat the home as real property. But be clear, it's still a mobile home. It will always be a mobile home. It just changes the way we're allowed to treat it. As an example, if I list land to sell and there's a mobile home sitting on that land, like the one in the left picture, even if they put it on blocks, but the wheels and everything's still there, I can list the land for sale. I can't do anything with the mobile home. That's personal property. The owner of the land can sell it. I can't touch it. Okay. On the other hand, 
if the three steps have been taken, I can treat it as real property, which means I can list it as a home for sale and I can put it in the MLS as such. However, first it asks you what kind of property it is. These are like check boxes. Well, it's a single family home. That's the category it's in, single family home. Then it asks you for construction. Under construction, it's a manufactured home. So it's still a manufactured home, it's still a mobile home, but because of the way it was treated, I can treat it like real property. Legally, it's real property, but the construction is still a mobile home, manufactured home. Is that clear? Okay. Now, a modular home is built off-site in factory-controlled environment. It meets state building code, transported to the site, assembled by the builder, has a state specification compliance, state inspection label with serial number. So a modular home, a true modular home is a stick built home. It's just a stick built in the factory. And one of the interesting things about these modular homes, most of them actually exceed the building code. They have to meet the state building code. Most of them exceed it. Isn't it, as an example, a lot of these modular homes don't use four inch studs, they use six inch studs on the exterior walls. So it's stick built, it's just stick built in the factory. So there's a couple of advantages. One is it can be built faster. Two is it can be built cheaper. And the third one is it's never been exposed to the weather. So we had that heavy rainstorm the other day and we've rained twice since then. And these two-story homes they're building behind us in Craigburn Forest is sitting out there getting rained on, the bare wood. Actually, it's OSB. But these homes have never been exposed to the weather. So there's a picture of them putting one of the units in place. They refer to them as boxes. Modular home label. These are usually found inside a kitchen cabinet on the door or the uh, service panel, the electric service panel. So, little info. We're back in Scranton, Pennsylvania at the Simplex factory where our modular home is being manufactured. We're checking in at various stages of the process over a number of weeks. Today we'll focus on the roof structure and some of the precautions taken before transporting the modules to the home site. Now let's get together with Dave Bonello inside the plant. Dave Bonello is with me. He's the Vice President of Marketing here at Simplex Homes and right now looks like it's coffee break time so it's a little bit quiet little bit but quiet normally it's a very noisy operation. Now. What box are we looking at here? We're looking at the second floor upper roof section that's going to go on top of our Berkshire. And project. this is over the front door of the house? This will be over the front door with the vaulted ceiling uh, in the foyer area. I think a lot of people probably think that a house manufactured in a factory would not have the same kind of wood framing that a stick-built house out in the field would have. A lot of people would think that, but that's really not a true aspect. What we're doing here is we're using framing materials that are very similar to any type of framing materials that you would see in, in the stick built industry. Mm -hmm. uh, you see that we're using some fur rafters here, two by 12 fur rafters. It's a, a trust rafter system that's designed for our industry. It has special ganged uh, nailers that have hinges built into them that well, allow us to be able to fold back eaves and fold back upper roof sections. Yeah, this is my next question, because what we're looking at here is really something that'll flip out in the field to create the overhang, the roof overhang, and there you see it. And then it just gets fastened down. Um, 
Let's put it back up. What are all these straps that I was looking at down here? Well, Bob, in is our that... industry, what we're doing is we're shipping products that can go anywhere from six miles to 600 miles. And the way we fasten things is we nail it, and then we follow it up with a strap that takes it from the top of the rafter cord down onto the wall or floor band, whatever it may be in that mm -hmm. case. And we're tying it with staples and metal uh, galvanized straps. What kind of plywood do you use for your sheathing? We're using GP Plytanium. It's a, it's a very flexible, stable product that is used in our industry. Uh, it allows us the ability to uh, not have any problems restricting us to any floor uses that we may want. Yeah, to you use. can use any kind of floor product in Absolutely. this. And when you've got a stable ply plywood like that, you don't have to worry about floor well, squeaking. especially the fact that we're shipping it down the road and there is some flexibility that's right. necessary. Right, so it's got to be tied down tight. What's Is this just part of the... This is a part of the gable end overhang that will be completed as we start moving this product down the production line. Okay, so what we're looking at here is a gable end wall, right? Yes, this is a gable end wall that was built on a table and brought over and placed in. We then fasten all of our gable end walls down with two nails and a screw in every bay. Some of the two other things. Two nails and a screw in, in every, every bay, bay down onto the sheathing. Tied right down and into the sheathing. And then what's the blocking that we're looking at here? This is a receiver for an, ins an, inside, an inside partition. Corner? Yep. Okay. And then the blocking we, at the bottom? Well, this particular product, Bob, has one by 10 base molding. So we've added blocking in here to help give us some good nailing when we're putting that base molding on later on. Okay, and you've got the rough wiring going on. Uh, this happens at this stage. I mean, at, at this point, you've got to do all the rough and then insulate and stuff. Right, let me show you what we, we do over here in our electrical department. We dado out our studs in advance, and then we run the, run the wires through, and we tie it into a box that we'll be placing over into this pre-routed hole. The hole is routed out in advance. Then the boxes are placed in. All right, so the wiring comes through these troughs here, and, and you've already cut the right hole out the for box. a box. So once once the uh, box is placed in and the wires are, are all fastened in place, we then will take these metal protectors, these dado protectors, and we'll put those over the the dadoed areas to protect from any nails that might happen in the sheathing process or in the siding process. Okay. Well, can we get up on this catwalk and take a look at it from up above? Sure. All right, so from the catwalk, we can get a good view of our three large windows. Yes. And I guess you've got the insulation process already started. Yes, the, after the wiring process, we then start to install insulation. We're using uh, Owens Corning. Uh, it's a fast bat insulation. It's great for our industry because of the fact that the drywall is installed on the table in advance. This allows us to friction fit this insulation without any mechanical fasteners. Terrific. It's terrific for our industry. So it really speeds things up. What's Fantastic. the R factor here? You got six inch walls. Six inch walls, but this is R21, not R19. Oh, it is? Yes, it is. Great. And then what is this other product that we're looking at up here? Well, this system, it's, it's a foam seal system. It's made, again, for the modular housing industry. It comes out in a liquid form as you see the foam build up. It turns into foam in a matter of seconds. It bonds the drywall to the bottom cord of the truss. When this when this fastens and sets up, you can't remove this drywall. So it replaces this mean, all mechanical fasteners. You don't have to use screws. No screws, no nothing. So nothing to pop through. It's great. I like that. It's phenomenal yeah. for our industry. And then I it. noticed in every bay you've got one of these metal straps. Right, what these, are they doing for us? These metal straps will be placed on. They'll be nailed to the side of that truss and bringing that fastening down into the wall system. Again, we don't want anything to vibrate loose okay. or pull okay. loose during so the set. There's another one of these hinges here, and what we're looking at here is the rest of the roof rafter. Right, that's the top cord of the roof. Uh, that hinge system will be lifted up in place, and then there's a knee wall that'll drop down. When this arrives at the site, that goes up. Okay, and then over here, they're putting in the rest of the overhang. Right, the guys are getting ready to tie this overhang in. It's a gable end overhang. We pre-build it, and it'll be fastened into the side of that uh, last truss. And that can travel down the highway. Absolutely. And then what I've got in front of them right here, what does that do? That uh, what, piece? what that piece does is that's the upper flip that's built into the truss. That will flip over during the set on job site, and when it flips over, that'll extend the roof run all the way up just prior to the ridge line. Okay, so this is the last section of the same overhang, right? 
Yes, uh, like I told you on the lower section, we have another gable, we have another gable end overhang that's going onto the upper roof section now. That's that section of roof that looks like a dormer sitting here, but that's gonna fold over. Again, like I mentioned earlier, job site. I tell you, those hinges really make it possible to get a lot of work done here in the factory. Phenomenal locations, and they keep us off. down low for transportation. Exactly. It's great. So we are looking at one of how many boxes, Dave? There's five larger boxes and two small boxes. And they will all seven. be completed during the course of? Roughly five days. Roughly a week's work here That's in the correct. plant. Yes. And then how long will it take you to get it to our site? One day. Half a day or thereabouts. And we'll, of course, look at the process over the course of several weeks. Yes. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Bob. We're back in Scranton, Pennsylvania. Hi, I'm Bob Vila. Welcome home again to our modular construction story. Today we're going to be giving you a recap of how our house was built in boxes. And of course, it's been trucking down the road for about four or five hours to get here to our location. We're going to be putting all the different boxes into the right places, showing you how it gets bolted together and basically constructing a big house in about half an hour. Stick around. It's good to have you home again. The moment we've all been waiting for is here. We're getting our houses put into place, or house our box sections, right, guys? And we've got Pat Prishoni and Dave Bonello from Simplex Industries joining us here in the Berkshires. What does that thing weigh? The box itself, Bob, is, is anywhere between 15 and 16 tons. That's a lot of tonnage. That's a lot of tonnage, yeah. Boy. And of course, I'm not sure what's in that section. Isn't that part of the kitchen? Yeah, that half is the kitchen, living room, and the dining room area is, is in that box. So have we got we got all our cabinets and our countertops in place there, and we've got obviously yeah. we got our Pella French doors looking looking at us. Nothing has broken along the way. No, everything held up fine in transportation. Yeah. And so what we've done is we've hired a, a company from another location to bring the crane here, right? That's correct. What size crane is that, Pat? It's an 80-ton uh, uh, crane, Bob. Are we going to be all right with an 80-ton oh, crane? Oh, well, uh, that should be fine. Yeah, good, good. Yeah, there's the arched wall. So this goes towards the, the very back of the foundation, right? Yes, this is the back box. Uh, there'll be another little piece uh, that we set over here. That little small section will be put on next, extending that dining room That's and making a much longer out. room. Right, yeah. right. Now, this has come a few hundred miles down the highway. And yes, obviously, you just don't drive out of the Simplex plant and head for the Berkshires. No, what that's... kind of planning has to be done before you get here? Well, what, what happens first is we actually have to run a route survey. Because these boxes are over 14 foot wide, these are actually 15 nine boxes. Yeah. They require uh, special routing more than the normal uh, width boxes would require. So we run a route survey up here and make sure that we're so going to clear person, all our... You mean a person goes out and scouts yes, all actually, the roads? Yes, uh, actually, one of our flag drivers would go out in advance, run the trip, and make sure that the uh, overpasses are, are all things that we can clear and make sure there's no uh, problems along the way that uh, might not normally be known about if you just took the map out and looked at the yeah, route. Yeah, sure. And, Pat, this is interstate commerce, isn't it? So that is correct. what yeah. happens and when you go from one state to the next? Well, uh, what we need to do is then our dispatch office needs to get that information from the route survey and apply for our permits. Mm -hmm. And every state has their own permit office, and they tell the permit office which routes we want to go in. Mm -hmm. So then in addition to that, uh, you know, there's also restrictions of roads and also times that we have to tr uh, travel across these roads. Yeah, and some of these roads, like right here, in the rural Berkshire Hills are tight and they're they have a lot tight. of hairpin turns. We also have an escort car. Sure. We have an escort car in the front and in the rear. And then when we got uh, a couple miles from uh, this uh, site here, since the roads were so narrow, mm -hmm. we also had to have a state police escort. And Dave, are the trucks that you use for pulling these these boxes on frames, is there anything unusual about the trucks? Yeah, Bob, they're actually modified to be able to uh, hitch up to the, the carriers and, and hook them and take them along. They're, they're, they're typical over-the-road trucks, but if you look at our trucks, the, the boxes on them are shorter, 
so that we're able to jockey around these sites a lot better than a, a exactly. normal tandem. So the, the truck turning would have. radius and everything is a lot shorter. Exactly. Great. All right, so here we can see our Superior Walls Foundation, which we put in just a week ago. And uh, this 15 ton section is about to sit down perfectly on our pressure treated sill. These guys know what they're doing with this crane business, don't they? Oh, yeah. they, sure, they sure do. Now, what, what have they rigged here? I see cable, but... Right, there's, there's cable and what we have, the, the apparatus up high is uh, spreader bars. And right. the cable is run through the spreader bars and basically comes down and wraps around the box. Mm -hmm. They drill holes in the outside bands here and they run the cable through. So really the meat of the band is, is what the cable's up underneath. And uh, this allows them then, with the hole in there, it allows them to be able to pull that cable out after the box is set down sure. so they can fit it and right it, on top of the And there's also pick plane. points that we need to be concerned with. What points? We call them pick points. Mm -hmm. And what they are is the fact that where we're actually going to put the, uh, the cables themselves at. And so we need to take measurements and we need to calculate where these pick points sh should be. And that, that refers to where you're picking it up in terms of the yeah. structure and in terms of the amount of stress that you're putting on exactly, it. Exactly, because you know you don't want to put a lot of you know stress on a certain area of the house itself. Mm -hmm. So you want to redistribute our pick points, we call it. Mm -hmm. Now on the inside, I noticed that they're putting up some temporary uh, supports, right? These these steel posts. <clears throat> they're right, exactly. What well, what they'll do is they'll put them in, and then they'll try to level the house off as best as they can. And then after they'll, it's leveled off, they'll come in and they'll put the jack posts in. Is the next section the one that corresponds to this towards the front? Well, actually, what we'll do is we'll take that small little piece, oh, we'll right. put we that on the back here that first. goes right here, right? right? The extension of the dining room, and then they'll put the front right. box in with the uh, living room and uh, stair area in it. Great. Let's go take a look. Next, we'll go inside the house and see how the interior layout is coming together. The crane is setting the second module for the first floor. This is the box that contains the front door for our house. Once this module is in place, we'll be able to take a look at the house on the inside. Dave, this is what you call the, the marriage point between the two boxes, right? Yeah, that's correct, Bob. You can see right here we have the come along on here, and we're getting ready to pull these two boxes together. And so and as it's they, being lowered by the crane, that piece of chain on, on the come along is bringing the two together. So right. that when they sit down, there's no crack in yeah. between. Exactly. They, they take it nice and easy and gently drop the box down. And as it's uh, reaching the sill plate, they're getting this as tight as we can possibly get it. This place is huge. It is, isn't it, Bob? I, you know, when you were in the factory looking at the different boxes, you had no idea yeah. until you're in the space itself and you realize. So this is the marriage wall. This is where the two boxes come together. And we're looking at a temporary post, but the rest of the steel columns, the lally columns are right here and they'll go up later today. Where's the, the, the staircase access? The stairwell's the right here, Bob. You see where that plywood oh, of is? Of course. Uh, they'll cut the plywood out and then they'll build the steps right here on site. So this is going to have all sorts of different living spaces, including an exercise room and a, fa a family area over here and a big TV den at the far end. Let's go look at things from the top side. Okay. Boy, this is impressive, though. What you, what you don't really get when you see those boxes flying through the air is that on the inside, they're totally finished, sure. except for a few little things. Now, what goes on here? Well, Bob, this, this we call this the marriage wall. Right. And what they're going to do now, they'll insulate this, they'll put some metal strapping on, and then they'll put the sheet rock right over and finish it. And that little bit of a gap is not a problem. No. No. And if you look down at the floor, there really is no gap. The two boxes have come together, and then we've got to continue putting in our Bella Wood floor. Mm -hmm. You really protect everything very carefully, don't you? Yes, yeah, so it's, it's pre-finished floor, and as you can see, we're all walking on it, so we want to yeah. try to protect it. Yeah. And the other thing, when you're in the factory making these rectangular boxes, you kind of think, well, everything's going to be a rectangle. But when you marry them, you start to get a sense of the volume of the space. And uh, this is the kitchen open to the dining area. And here again, you've got temporary stuff. Right, that'll Tem all, get that'll all come out now. Now this expands. Mm -hmm. And this will be the bump that we just put in a few minutes ago. And then this entire area is a living room. That What's the dimension here? This is uh, roughly uh, 30 by uh, 30 by about 17 or 18 foot wide. This is a big living room. Yeah, sure it's is. Huge. 
And here is where you've got uh, a complicated marriage, don't you? Well, this is just a temporary study that we have in here just to you know, keep, for the, keep the boxes together as they're being transported and set on site. Okay. Now, they'll all come out, and then we'll be able to finish this uh, with a nice flat ceiling. But the extraordinary thing is that once it's on site, you've got all of these fasteners that are put in, these bolts going through that they can get at from the top side. Correct. And so all of this has been thought about. It's, and it's all been engineered. It's all been engineered, exactly. All right, it's confusing to see a, a second story section that looks like this, but essentially it's a big shed dormer into a gable end. I mean, into a gabled roof. That's, that's correct. Right. And the other thing that makes it look confusing is the door that's in there. Yeah. Because you're not used to seeing a door on the second floor, but that door is going to open up and go out over that little bump out that we had in the dining room. That floor will eventually be built up to meet that, and there'll be a little outside terrace area. A little area. outside balcony or terrace yeah. goes there. And of course, we're looking at all this complicated roof framing, which uh, is hinged and uh, flips into place. So there's quite a bit of work to be done with this section once it's, it, once it's in place. That's correct. But again, the, the beauty of the system is the hinges allow it to just fold right down uh, the, the eave areas. And then the upper flip area, where it continues up to the ridge, again, will fold over. And the plywood's already installed on, on a good part of that. So we'll just have strips that have to be placed in that'll tie the bottom to the middle and the top to the middle of the roof structure. And of course, this did not travel down the highway the way we're looking at it here. It's already been unwrapped, if you will. But right, the other section, which is still uh, not in place, is shrink wrapped, essentially, so that when it's coming down the highway, nothing's going to fly away. That's correct. We've got to protect the unit from the elements. So all this roof structure is, again, shrink wrapped. But you can see we've left a little bit of the framing in here in these large openings. That's just temporary framing. And again, that will all be removed once that box is set down. Those studs will be taken out, and that will all be opened up into the other half when, the, when it mates up to it. All right, so the third of the four principal boxes are now in place. That's correct. And before the other one gets here and marries this one, let's get a, a little bit of an idea of structurally what we're looking at here. There's more to it than you'd expect, right? Yeah, Bob, what's, what's a little different about our technology here is we build a, a separate ceiling from the floor system. So this does two things. It enables us to install the drywall in the plant and have a finished ceiling downstairs. Then we put the second box, this other box on top with the separate floor system. With the floor system. And so here we're looking at the, the width of the floor system, and here we've got the additional width of the ceiling system for the first floor. Correct. So the next box is going to sit on top of this, this plate that's on top of the ceiling below. Mm -hmm. The beauty of this is this floor system now is going to act independent of the ceiling below. Uh -huh. And when you have the kids upstairs running around or people upstairs, you're not going to hear that noise it, because of the framing member being a different member than the ceiling member below. That's and a beautiful thing in the modular neat. technology. And you can use the modular technology, for example, for a two-family house so that you would also have noise abatement between one unit and, and the unit down below. That's, that's a great example of where our technology really does uh, exceed stick belt. Now, as the crane sets this next module for the second floor, it'll form another marriage wall. This floor will have two bedrooms, a bath, and a balcony. We have a great site crew, and this whole process is happening very fast. Coming up next, we're ready to set the master bedroom module and complete our modular house. Michael Shields is our general contractor here, and have you ever seen anything like this? No, it's quite a project, Bob. Very exciting. And how, what have you got done up till now in terms of the rest of the groundwork? Well, we've installed our plumbing inside mm -hmm. in the lower section. We've got our inspections for that. Mm -hmm. We put our slab inside before the modulars are set, completed all the footing drains around the foundation, and we've put in the sills in preparation for the modular set. And a minute ago, we saw them setting the sixth piece, I guess, which comprises the sunroom that we have, right? Yes. And the sunroom is approximately what dimension? It's 17 by 20. 17 by 20. Yeah, all of these boxes are a good size. It's a very large house. Okay, and now we're about to see uh, the, oh, I wanted to mention, have you ever seen them do this? These are the frames that each and every one of these boxes arrived on. 
And I was wondering what they were going to do with the empty ones, and the crane just stacked them all up. So Efficient way to get them back to the factory. Only one cab needed for all three boxes. Exactly. Well, here comes number seven. Now, this box is the whole master bedroom and bath, right? That's correct. So it's got the added weight of a lot of plumbing. A lot of plumbing, a lot of tiles been installed in this box. The finished floor and the master bedroom's already been installed. Mm -hmm. Boy, it's hard to believe that you can steer this box into place just with two ropes and two guys. Right. Well, with the cables at a center point there, they can pretty much pivot it. Yeah, that's a very interesting rig up there. Yes. Now, this is about 15 tons, right? That's correct. Now, Mike, why wouldn't you want to backfill before you set the boxes down on the foundation? Uh, the foundation that we've used here is a superior wall. It's pre-engineered and pre-cast, so when we set it, it relies on the weight of the box to keep it from moving. A standard application for a foundation would be pour the foundation, backfill, and then you can work closer, closer to the box. But mm -hmm. because of the engineered system here, we need the weight of the box to stabilize the wall. To stabilize it before you put the pressure of the soil back in. That's right, Bob. And we have lift down. All right, that is a clever way of getting those trailers back out of here. Now, I noticed the roof is already starting to go up, but I wanted to ask you one last question. From the builder's perspective, what's the advantage of going modular? Production time. Our production time is cut in half. Really? Yes. So that makes all the difference. Production time and cost per square foot is cheaper. Is cheaper by 10, 20? 25 percent. 25 percent. Yes. That's great. All right. When we come back, we'll see how the modular hinge system simplifies raising the roof. OK, I think we can do without that last part. All right, now this, at this point, this is going So I'm going to have to pause the share, estates and real property. So the word estate, most people, when they hear the word estate, they think of one of two things. One is a palatial home. And of course, that's the Biltmore house up in Asheville. Or the other thing they think about is estate planning, wills, those kinds of things. And the fact is, the word estate we're using here is neither one of those things. The estate is a legal term. So an estate is an interest in real property. Now, you're familiar with the word interest, like interest paid on a loan, interest you might earn on an IRA. Uh, the Fed raised the interest rate effective today, quarter of a percent. That was on TV. But that's not the interest we're talking about here. An estate is an interest in real property. Interest meaning your all-encompassing ownership of the property. That's what your interest is. It's like, think of it this way. It's like you're interested in football. You're interested in baseball, fishing. Here, your interest is in the property. So quite literally, the definition of an estate is an interest in real property, including a present or future right of ownership and or possession. Some estates involve ownership. Some estates just involve possession, not ownership. So there's different kinds of estates and that's what we're gonna be talking about. So an estate is an interest in real property 
including a present or future right of ownership or possession. And uh, this is a definition I found, just a little bit different way to look at it. Property interest refers to the extent of a person or entity's rights in property. Now, entity means a legal entity. Entity means a corporation, an LLC, a partnership that can own property. So property interest refers to the extent of a person or entity's rights in property. It deals with the percentage of ownership, time period of ownership, right of survivorship, and rights to transfer or encumber the property. It means all of that. Two basic kinds of estate, freehold. Freehold estate lasts at least a lifetime. On its simplest level, freehold estate is ownership. Non-freehold, not freehold, non-freehold does not last a lifetime. Lasts a period of time, but not a lifetime. And it's not ownership. So freehold estate literally means free from hold. Nobody else has a hold on the estate. Non-freehold estate. Leasehold. So somebody has a hold on the estate. And as the word lease implies, we're talking about renting. So if you have a property that's a rental property, investment property, the owner has a freehold estate. The owner's ownership of the property is free from hold. However, the tenant holds a non-freehold estate. And that is a leasehold. estates of inheritance. So what are the estates that can be inherited? And then I also use the word fee. And if you look at the first arrow bullet, freehold estates inheritable, also known as a fee estate. And in the parentheses, I explain the word fee literally means inheritable. And you may have seen that word used before and not known what it means. Maybe in your contract, maybe in your deed. But the word fee indicates the estate is inheritable. We have the fee simple absolute, the fee simple determinable, the fee simple subject to a condition subsequent, and the estate for the life of another. So let's look at them one by one. Fee, simple, absolute. Highest estate in real property. The property is always transferable. Not always free of encumbrances, but it's always transferable. You can sell it, you can will it, you can give it away. And it probably has encumbrances on it. Now we cover encumbrances next, but I'll go ahead and tell you an encumbrance, an example, perfect example of an encumbrance is your mortgage. It's a burden on your property because you can't sell the property till you pay off the mortgage. Another example of an encumbrance would be property taxes. So that's what the encumbrance is. And very, very few properties are free of all encumbrances. Now, when you see this written in a legal document, as an example, if you pull out the contract where you purchased your property, if you do pull out your deed, 
you won't find the word absolute there. It's just going to say fee simple. The reason is, and this is the, just the funny way the law works sometimes with its, with its words, they have to tell you if it's not absolute. So anytime it is absolute, they don't put the word in. They just say fee simple. If it's not absolute, they'll tell you what other kind of a state it is. So again, if you look in your purchase contract, if you look in your deed, you'll see that you hold a fee simple estate. That means absolute. Next, we have the feasible fee estates. The feasible literally means the estate can be defeated. Certain situations, the estate can be defeated. They can also be called determinable estates or qualified fee estates. The thing is, there's limitations on the estate. There's a condition on the estate. That's what all of this means. Okay. So the estate may be lost defeated, that's where the word defeasible comes in, may be defeated, lost, by doing something that's a condition in the deed or not doing something that's a condition of the deed. And if it is defeated, what happens to it? It may revert, and the word revert means go back. It may revert to the original grantor. And if that's what's gonna happen, the owner is said to have a reversionary right. Or it may pass forward, pass means go forward to a remainderman if a remainderman is named in the deed. And if there is a remainder man, they have a remainder interest. So, the two divisible states we're going to look at are the fee simple determinable and the fee simple condition subsequent. Fee simple de determinable estate, it is defeasible. It can be defeated in certain situations. The grantor grants property to be used for one purpose only. Now understand, the word grantor in most situations is the seller. The word grantor is the person who's transferring the property. And the vast majority of the time, that means they're selling it. Okay. So the grantor grants the property, but there's a restriction on it. It's actually in the deed. The property can be used for one purpose only. You can only do this one thing on the property. If the property is ever used for anything else other than the stated purpose, it will revert back to the grantor automatically. That's a fee simple determinable. Now, 14, 15 years ago, I was on my way to Raleigh for a real estate commission conference, an educators conference. And this was on Highway 70, just west of Goldsboro. And I caught the for sale sign out of the corner of my eye. And when I got to the next place I could make a U-turn, I made a U-turn and went back and parked in the church parking lot, which is where I took this picture from. And I know it was pre-smartphone because I had to actually get out of the car, go to my trunk and get my camera. So I took this picture because of the for sale sign. So let me blow it up for you. Anybody that buys this property must operate a church or ministry.
That's a fee simple determinable estate. Anybody can buy it, but the only thing they can do on the property is either have a church or some kind of ministry. If they do anything else, it will revert back to whoever's selling it. So that condition is in the deed. And that's a fee simple determinable estate. And it's unusual you see it in a sign. That's why I wanted to get the picture. Now, I give you a different example in the book Okay. Um, if we look in the book, right under the word automatically, right about the middle punch hole, example, Joan deeds land to the county school district for so long as the school district maintains an elementary school on the land. Jones, as the former owner and grantor, has a reversionary interest in the property because if the school district ever ceases operating a school, the property reverts back to Jones, or if Jones is gone, his heirs. So it will remain a fee simple determinable estate in perpetuity forever. The next one is the fee simple subject to a condition subsequent. Also defeasible, it works differently. Property is granted to be used for anything but a particular use. So you buy the property, you can do anything you want on it, but this one thing, okay? And if it's ever used for the prohibited purpose, the property can revert back to the grantor, but the grantor has to take legal action to make that happen. It's not automatic. So the example I have in the book for this one is a real example. A woman shared this with me. Actually, she shared it with the whole class. I was teaching for the J.Y. Monk School in Greenville 14, 15 years ago, whenever. And she shared this information when we got to the simple subject to a condition subsequent. A woman deeds land to her grandson. The grandson here in this story is this woman's brother. It was her grandmother too. So a woman deeds land to her grandson so he can build a restaurant on it. She has her attorney add language creating the estate stating that if intoxicating beer or liquors are sold on the premises, grantor has the right to re-enter and repossess the land. The, the right to re-enter and repossess is you have the right to take legal action and take the land back. That's a fee simple subject to a condition of subsequent. Now, he could have put a house on the land, assuming it was owned. He could do anything he want with the land. The only thing he can't do is sell booze. Which, by the way, he started doing. See, that's not here. But she told us. See, when he, she gave him the land, the grandmother gave him the land, and he built his restaurant, it was a moot point because the county was dry. They couldn't serve any alcohol in restaurants. And of course, you know what the rest of the story is, right? A few years after he built his restaurant, the county had a referendum and they passed liquor by the drink and he started selling liquor, beer, everything. Well, when Granny found out, she called him up and she said, hey, bub, you might have forgotten, but I haven't. You can't do that. And if you don't stop doing it right now, the next call you're getting is from my attorney and I'm gonna take the land back. 
And his sister shared with the class that he stopped selling it and went out of business two years later. And he blamed it on the fact he couldn't sell beer and alcohol. But all you need to know is what a condition of subsequent estate is. And at the very bottom of the page, the typical language found in a deed for a fee simple subject to a condition subsequent is on the condition that. And then what follows is the thing they're not allowed to do. So when it comes to just these two estates, the fee simple determinable and the fee simple condition subsequent. If you get asked about this on the exam, all they're going to ask you about is which one reverts automatically and which one is not automatic. So here's how you can remember this. And there will be times in this course, I ask you a very simple question and you think I'm an idiot. You think, why is he asking us that? Is he kidding? But I'm not. How many words is determinable? How many words is that? One. One. How many words is automatic? One. How many words is condition subsequent? Two. How many words is not automatic? I can't make it any simpler than that. Determinable is automatic. One word for one word. Condition subsequent is not automatic. Two words for two words. Because that's what they're going to ask you about. Now, that's not in the book, so you probably want to write that down or do a screenshot or whatever. And you guys are gonna to have to do better. You let my coffee get cold. Okay. That takes us to the top of page 10 and the estate for the life of another. Property is granted to one person for as long as another person lives. Sounds crazy, but that's what it is. Property is granted to one person for as long as another person lives. This also can be called an estate poor auctor V. Remember what I told you, you don't have to know how to say it or spell it, you just need to be able to recognize it, poor auctor V. Now, if you don't recognize poor auctor V, it's French. So it brings up the issue, we are a state that, whose laws are based on old English common law. What are we doing with some French in our law? And the answer is nobody knows. I'm just saying it's very unusual to have this. Okay. I've never actually run into this in practice. I've never seen a deed that was written up this way. So, The example in the book, Franklin, a man, Franklin grants a life estate to his daughter-in-law for as long as her son, the grantor's grandson, lives. So think about just that part of it for a second. The guy grants a life estate to his daughter-in-law, but her holding the life estate is based on her son's life. In other words, what's going on here is the guy's giving his daughter-in-law a house, but he's giving the daughter-in-law the house for the benefit of his grandson, not for her benefit. 
So if the grandson dies, she loses the house. The estate goes away. Okay. An estate for the life of another. And the other, in this case, is the grandson. So her holding the estate is based on her son's life. Upon the grandson's death, the grantor has the right to re-enter and repossess the land. They can hire an attorney and take it back and kick the daughter-in-law out. That brings us to the non-inheritable or non-fee freehold estate. So it is freehold, but it's not inheritable. And another way of saying not inheritable is not fee, non-fee. And this is what many people simply call a life estate. And a lot of people also call it a conventional life estate. Same thing, just another way to call it. So how does the conventional life estate work? Property is granted to a person for as long as they live. For as long as they live. At death, the property will either revert back to the grantor, or if there's a remainderman named in the deed, it will pass to the remainderman. And it will do either one of those automatically. Now, Annie, my wife, has an aunt in Snow Hill, northwest out of Kinston a little bit. She and her husband lived in a house the husband's sister owned the house next door to them, and they, she also owned the house they were living in. The husband's sister had given the husband a life estate. The husband passed away, and the way the deed was written, if the husband passed away, the life estate transferred to his wife, his widow, Annie's cousin. And she's still living there. She still has a life estate, but she doesn't actually own the house. Her sister-in-law next door owns the house. She has a life estate in it. When she dies, it'll go back to the, to the sister-in-law automatically. That's how a life estate works. And sometimes families use life estates for several reasons. One reason is because it keeps the property in the family. Now, you don't have to be a family member. They give a life estate anybody they want, but usually it's used in a family and it keeps the property in the family. The other thing it does is when this happens, when any cousin dies and it reverts to the original grantor, it will do that immediately and automatically. It's not inheritance, which means it's not taxed. Now, a clarification here. The word tenant, believe it or not, does not mean renter. The word tenant is one of those words that we have misused for so long, there's no going back. But the truth is the word tenant doesn't actually mean renter. The word tenant means an individual who occupies or possesses land or premises so the distinction between land and premises, premises would be the house on the land. So who occupies or possesses land or premises by way of a grant of an estate of some type, such as in fee, for life, 
four years or at will. So it would apply to a tenant, but not because they're renters, because they hold a non-freehold estate. Now, I'm not telling you to stop using it because everybody still uses it to mean, to mean renter. I'm just telling you that's not the real meaning of the word. And the reason I'm clarifying this is because we are going to start referring to this, the person holding the life estate as a life tenant. And if you don't understand that the word tenant doesn't actually mean renter, you'll think they're renting the property and they're not, they own the property. So life estate interest, the grantor holds a reversionary interest or the remainderman holds a remainder interest. So let me give you another example of a life estate. Let's say my mom is elderly, she's in her mid eighties. But she's very independent, she's very active, she still drives. She lives on the other side of town. Annie and I want to get her a little closer to us so that if something happens, if she does need us, we can, we can help her. But on the other hand, of course, we don't want her too close. If you catch my drift, okay? I own a property next door. So I go to my mom, I say, hey, mom, why don't you let me give you this property next door? It's a nice house. Nobody's living in it. It's in great shape, furnished. I'll just give you the property. And she agrees. So I contact my attorney and I tell her to draw up a deed making my mom the life tenant in the property. It will transfer all the rights of the property to her so long as she lives. And she owns it. She's not paying rent. She owns it. And the truth is, once I do that, and once I give her the deed and the deed's recorded, it's hers. She literally could prevent me from going on the property because I don't own it anymore. I have no rights to it. I just gave them all away. That's a life estate. She's a life tenant and she owns it to the day she dies. Now, when I got my attorney to write the deed, I said, just have it revert to me. So he would make her the life tenant and on her dying, it would revert back to me. I get the house back. But maybe I don't want the house back. Maybe I figure, you know what? She lives another few years. Let's just have the house go to our son. So I tell the attorney, make my son the remainderman. And that will be written in the deed. So that when she dies, it doesn't come back to me. It passes to the remainderman. Okay? Now, if it reverts back to me or if it passes to a named remainderman, it will transfer fee simple. The condition will come off and it won't be a life estate anymore. What can the life tenant do with the property as long as they live, as long as they own it? They can sell their interest in the property, but see, here's where it gets a little sticky. What's their interest? Their interest is their lifetime. In other words, they could sell their lifetime interest in the property. When they die, it's still coming back to me. Now, I know what you're thinking. Who in the world would buy it? Well, I didn't say anybody would buy it. I just said she could sell it. If you, you know, if we're talking about what the law provides for, theoretically, somebody could see some value in the property where they buy her lifetime interest, hoping she's going to live for 20 years. I, I, this is totally different, but it, it, it goes to how people think when they buy property. When Duke Power 
created Lake Norman. There was a bunch of the land Duke Power owned and they let that land out on 25 year leases. You could lease a waterfront lot from Duke Power for a re very reasonable amount, yearly, yearly rent. There were people that five years, 10 years into the lease would sell that lease to somebody else. Somebody else is willing to come in and pay $20,000 for what was left on, you know, the 15 years left on the lease. And they bought it, understanding that at the end of the 25 years, they had moved. All they were buying was the time on the lease. Here, all they would be buying is the time left in her life. Because that's all she holds. That's her interest. See, this brings us back to that word interest. She has a lifetime interest. She could borrow money against the property, but again, only for her lifetime which probably means no institutional lender is gonna loan her money on the property. Because again, it would still revert back to me or pass to my son. She can rent the property and pocket the rent. She can use wood or fuel on the land she has. Excuse me, she can use wood on the land, timber if you will, for fuel and repairs. So she could cut down a tree or two to burn in the fireplace. Or she could cut down enough trees to sell to raise money to make necessary repairs on the property. But what the life tenant can't do is profit from the timber. In other words, she couldn't sell or lease the timber rights or allow somebody to come in and clear cut the timber. Now also understand the timber we might be talking about is two trees. But see, what if this property next door to me was 15 acres and the house stood in a quarter acre clearing and the rest of the land was trees? They have value. They cannot waste the life estate. Waste is a legal term that means she can't let it devalue. She's got to maintain the value in the property, okay? And she has to make ordinary repairs. She has to pay the property taxes. And she even has to pay the interest on a pre-existing loan. So if I had an equity line or second mortgage on the property, according to the law, she has to pay the interest on my loan. And she can't will the property because there's nothing to will. Because the very second she dies, her estate ceases to exist. So there's literally nothing for her to will. Now, she has to make repairs. She has to pay property taxes. She has to pay the interest on a pre-existing loan. Whether I actually make her do those things probably depends on what kind of son I am. But see, that's not what we're talking about here, guys. We're talking about what does the law require? And this is exactly what the law requires. This right the life tenant holds in the wood or timber is known as estovers. And that's there at one of the bullets under the wood at the end of the line. Now, many states have what's called a marital life estate. Now, North Carolina has a general statute, a state law, it's called the intestate succession law. And that law, when North Carolina passed it, overturned or superseded how common law would dictate it. And many states still use the common law. They haven't passed any state laws. 
So the common law used to be known as Dowager and I have that misspelled, I'm gonna fix it. It's actually supposed to be courtesy, not curtsy. So uh, you don't have to spell things, but you might wanna fix that in the book anyway, because I have it spelled curtsy, it's supposed to be courtesy. And you don't have to know the details of this, but in the common law, the dowager was the right of a widow and courtesy was the right of a widower. At any rate. So in the states that still use the common law, the dowager courtesy, the surviving spouse, one spouse dies, the surviving spouse can claim a one-third marital interest in any real property owned by the deceased spouse. During the marriage, even if it's been transferred early, earlier, even if it was sold before they died. For this reason, when people are married and one of them owns a property and they want to sell it, they always get the other spouse to sign the deed. We'll talk about it tomorrow when we get to ownership. It's referred to as one to buy, two to sell. But because of this, they would get both spouses to sign the deed, even though only one of them actually owned the property. It was because of this marital right that the other spouse held. And that way they could deliver a clear title. Now, on the top of 11, we have a diagram that breaks these estates down. So we have the freehold estates. Remember, freehold estates last at least a lifetime. Freehold estate means ownership. And then it's broken down into two categories, estates of inheritance and estates not of inheritance. I could also have said fee estates and non-fee estates. Remember, fee means inheritable. So if we look at the estates of inheritance, we have the fee simple absolute, the fee simple, and that's a, a typo, the fee, it says the de, deasable, it's supposed to be an F, the feasible. And I can't just change it because it's actually a JPEG image. So the feasible, and the fee for a life of another, or poor auctor V. Under the fee simple defeasible, we've got the fee simple determinable and the fee simple subject to a condition subsequent. Over to the estates not of inheritance or non-fee, we've got the conventional life estate, and we have the marital life estate. North Carolina doesn't have a marital life estate, but many states do. Then I put in these two diagrams. On these the feasible estates, if the property is going to revert, the grantor grants the life estate to the grantee. So in my little scenario, I'm the grantor, my mom is the grantee. OR indicates the person's giving something, EE indicates they're receiving it. So I give the life estate to my mom, the grantee, she passes away, it reverts to me immediately and automatically, not inheritance. Or if I've named the remainderman in the deed, 
when she passes away, it doesn't come back to me. It passes to the remainder men instead. Now, that brings us to the non-freehold estate, which is also referred to as leasehold. So a non-freehold estate is created when somebody rents property. So a property that is subject to a lease actually has two estates at the same time. Leasehold conveys temporary possession to a tenant. Tenant has a hold on the property. Leased fee, the owner's interest in the property. They're getting paid a fee, the rent. Tenant pays the fee to the lessor. Landlord has a leased fee or freehold estate. The owner has a freehold estate. The tenant has a non-freehold estate. The lease transfers when the property, when the property is sold. Now we'll talk about this again, but what that last line means is if I'm working with a buyer and the house they like happens to be rented and it's tenant occupied, they can buy the house, but they're gonna have to honor the lease. So if they're wanting to live in the house, they can't do that until the lease expired. Maybe it has nine months left on it. They're gonna have to wait nine months. And see, I've had this happen where they really wanted the house, but they couldn't wait until the lease expires and the tenant wasn't willing to give it up. So we had to move to a different property and buy something else. Because the new owner has to honor the lease. A lease creates an encumbrance on the property. Okay. So 